Hi everyone, I'm Kim C, and this is the Year of Underrated Stephen King Podcast. I am a university fiction teacher, and this is my one-woman show, where I take a literary deep dive into the lesser-explored King novels, because they're in desperate need of more eyes on them. Hello, buddies, and welcome to the Fantasy Realm! Today's King novel in the spotlight is... 1984's The Eyes of the Dragon. Oh, friends, I was super into this. Oh, I feel like clapping. I really enjoyed this. Wow, really can't believe more people aren't talking about this one. What a little diamond in the rough. This story is packing some serious treasure within. I'm so excited to be here with you guys as we pop open this trunk. Oh my goodness, so much to pull out. But let's first start with how elegantly beautiful King's writing is in this story. Whoa, guys. Whoa. Friends, it's so lovely. Oh man. The plot is very simple but powerful. The characters we have aren't robustly built, but they work really well. And the beauty of this story is is its simplicity and how King uses mystery and subtlety. And I am very impressed, folks. Very impressed I am, everyone. Wow. Okay. All right. My emotions are running away with me. So let's dive right in, my guys. We have a lot to cover, a lot to discuss about this hugely underrated gem that personally, side note, Had this been written 10 to 20 years later, oh my gosh, I really believe this one could have been huge. With today's marketing and book deals, this could have absolutely been a three book deal, if not more. I know we already had the Dark Tower blossoming, sort of, but this could have been so much more epic. We really could have had more on this one. It would have been beautiful. And it looks like Eyes of the Dragon has been in the hot, cold stages in the film adaptation, TV adaptation realm, which somebody needs to get their hands on this because it will be killer on screen, my guys. Absolutely beautiful on screen, this one would be. But for now, let's talk about what led King to write a fantasy novel in the mid-80s. I think the majority of constant readers out there know that the specific reason most discussed is his eldest daughter, Naomi, who was 12 to 13 around 1984, and she didn't want a scary story, but asked her dad for a fun story about things that she liked, something that had heroes and dragons and rad stuff that she enjoyed reading about. And so King decided to have a crack and give it a go, and he produced this really engaging good versus evil story that had some interesting fantasy requirements plugged in. We've got dragons, kings, princes, magicians, spells, castles, really the whole lot, if you will. And apparently, all y'all, at least a lot of devoted constant readers back in the day, when they got their hands on a copy of Eyes of the Dragon, got a huge bee in their bonnet from this story. I'm not saying you specifically, but you listening, you know who you are. If you hated Eyes of the Dragon, you were part of the problem. So I guess these longtime Ride or Die King fans had really become quite accustomed to his spooky tales and all of his horror output. So this deviation, which it is a deviation, (laughs) this is a 180 from what he usually composes, this story got a lot of readers riled up and not in a good way, and this irritated King a little bit. Although, to be honest, I don't really believe he should have been irritated because right around the time Salem's Lot was published, his publishers told him, Stevie, you're going to get typecast in the horror genre if you keep this up. And Steve said that he didn't care 
as long as the checks didn't bounce because in that time, King is writing to keep the lights on and priority one were those fat stacks of cash. In theory, what did he expect, friends? I'm sorry, Steve, you were warned. You were warned this could happen. You said you didn't care. Fast forward 10 years and now you care a great deal. Personally, I think he needed to remember those initial early days, but history being as it is, King got a little peeved that the reception of this story wasn't very favorable. And I can understand you'd be a little ticked off if you really put your heart and soul into trying something new. And side note, it worked and it was totally awesome. But I guess a lot of you out there disagreed vehemently. And so a couple years later, we get this 1987 novel called Misery about what happens to a writer when his number one fan disagrees when he deviates from the genre. Powerful stuff. So in reality, you guys are to blame for Annie Wilkes. Which, thinking about how all of that is connected, is absolutely mind-blowing and amazing. It is unknown to me if this story is 100% true, but it seems to be agreed upon as the accepted narrative that's floating around out there. So we're just gonna keep that in our mind's eye for now. But yes, Eyes of the Dragon really got fans hot and bothered and not in the sexy way. They let King know in droves and he was a little put off by that reception. And then suddenly we have Paul Sheldon and Annie Wilkes in that absolute horror show of a masterpiece novel amazing stuff, so Eyes of the Dragon is connected to that. At least it seems to be the case. If there are negating facts that counteract that, please let Kim C know immediately. <laughs> I would love to know the true story if the story I had is a little fudgy, but onward. I really loved this story, friends, and I can't wait to unpack it here today. If you are just joining us for the very first time, hello, hello, and welcome. Today's episode is going to break down into an exploration of the following categories. Firstly, we're going to take a look at characters. I think it's going to be a really good place to start with this story. We've got some interesting ones to chat about, and they have a lot of cool symbolism attached to them, so we're going to start there. Next, we'll head into novel strengths and what's working well. After that, we'll transition into criticism and questions, and then we'll head out from there. As you guys know, or if you don't, I really do try my very best to avoid spoilers, but please take caution that something might squeak out in the heat of the moment. So just a heads up there, buyer beware, it is always recommended that you come to these episodes having previously read these titles or previously listened to them on audiobook, and if you haven't read Eyes of the Dragon and you're thinking about it, the audiobook narrated by actor Bronson Pinchot, wow, friends, really, really exceptional. I was very impressed, and for those of you who don't know Bronson, you might have seen in the 1995 miniseries that was The Langoliers. He's one of our villains in that film. He did an excellent job, actually. I mean, the script was what it was, but he did really well. He does a terrific job with the audiobook. It was compelling. He really puts his all into it. When he yells, oh man, guys, you are on the stage. You are in that booth with him. Truly incredible. So I recommend if you've just read the novel The Brick and Mortar Way and you want to enhance your memory of the story and really give a treat for your brain, let's do the audiobook with narrator Bronson Pinchot. Before we get down to business, let's start off with a summary that discusses this 326-page novel. Of course, I'm referring to the American hardcover. This is the Viking publication because I believe it was originally published in 84, but then mass-produced in 87. So I have the 87 copy. It is a vibrant green, a beautiful green with a dragon on the cover. I love it so much. We've got almost 330 pages. 
and a novel patched together out of 140 micro chapters. Really cool stuff. Okay, here we go. Roland the Good is the king of the moderately prosperous and peaceful kingdom of Delane. He has two sons. Peter is the heir to the throne, and five years younger, there is Thomas. Peter is all things good and just, and Thomas struggles in the shadow of his older brother. When the king unexpectedly dies, young Peter is convicted and imprisoned for his death, and young Thomas becomes king of Delane with the watchful and ever-present magician Flag constantly by his side. The kingdom of Delane slides into ruin as hope for the true identity of the king's murderer falls into shadow. It is only the first son Peter and some devoted friends to keep hope alive that the rightful king will ascend the throne of Delane. All right, loves. This simple bedtime story novel is a real joy. Oh my gosh, I must say, once more, I'm moved, I'm impressed, I'm encouraged, I'm excited, I'm a lot of good things. So let's head through those castle gates and start the show. Hear ye, hear ye, good people of Delane. Welcome to the character section found within Eyes of the Dragon. With any good bedtime story, I think it most appropriate to begin with the players, and that's what we're gonna do. In the novel Eyes of the Dragon, King brings us about a dozen characters, but I'm only gonna talk about seven of them because those seven were definitely the cream of the crop for me. I really held these people in my mind's eye. Lots of strong symbols, really surprising details. Some were really robust, some not as developed, but still subtle and striking. So much sophistication and loveliness in this story, my friends. Let's hope right now that we do a decent job cracking into this. Let us begin with King Roland the Good. Does King Roland of Delane have anything to do with Roland of Gilead? Unknown? I hope there's a bloodline somewhere, someplace. It's all very possible in the world of King. But in this story, King Roland the Good is so interesting. Okay, What's very cool about His Royal Highness King Roland is King takes a very interesting direction for this character. Typically, in the rare fantasy novel I read, but the abundant fantasy drafts I read from my students, usually those on the throne are either the most sadistic, awful, terrible people ever, think of George R. R. Martin's mad royalty in the House of Targaryen. House Lannister is pretty icky too. Or they're the exact opposite, polar opposite rather. They are just good and just and wonderful. The people love them. They rule a peaceful kingdom, prosperous. What King does is make a character who I don't think we had the vocabulary for it in 1984, but he strikes me as being very on the spectrum, ladies and gentlemen. 
This is a guy who really likes to be alone. He is very socially inept, kind of awkward. He is not very present when he's with people. He's consistently in his mind, his head in the clouds. He likes to do his own thing, focus intensely on what he's doing. He's also very much an asexual person. He gets married to a beautiful lady of the court named Queen Sasha, who we're going to talk about next. She's significantly younger than him and just beautiful and special and sweet in all the ways. He does not want anything to do with carnal knowledge. He does not have any sexual fetishes. He is not a fan of houses of ill repute. This guy is just not into it. He is just can't be bothered. Peter is born, and then five years later, it's pretty much a miracle that Thomas is born because the king doesn't really enjoy sex. I love King Roland because he's such a peculiar individual that I find incredibly mind-boggling for the strange, unique, and subtle character attributes King gave him. Unfortunately, King Roland isn't great at the social stuff, right? So when he's with his sons, he just doesn't really know how to be there with them. He doesn't understand how to be loving and supportive and connect. He can't connect with his children. He also really can't connect with his wife, but this marriage was definitely political only. But King Roland is relatively good guy. He doesn't have any incriminating proclivities that lead him down these dark and sinister paths. He does put too much trust in his magician named Flag. More on that later. But King Roland is so... Wow. Looking at this individual and what a unique person he is. Relatively good king, ruling a peaceful kingdom. The land is somewhat prosperous. The people don't hate him. It's not too bad. He's just a little bit awkward, socially depleted. I would love to know what you guys think about King Roland. Super sophisticated and strange. Next, we have Queen Sasha. Sadly, we don't get a lot of time with Queen Sasha, but what I love in regards to her character is how King makes her larger than life in death rather than in her small life. When we open the story, King Roland is approximately 35, and she is said to be about half his age. She is just lovely, a very loving mother, has an immense passion for her sons, and that symbolism of her love and devotion and dedication, it's definitely something that echoes throughout the story. Unfortunately, shortly after Thomas is born, Queen Sasha exits the novel. I won't reveal how. You can kind of connect the dots if the little prince was just born and she doesn't really last much longer after that, but I really enjoy how Queen Sasha is a much stronger symbol in this novel because she had to exit the story so quickly. So we'll talk more about symbols in the next section, but Queen Sasha, she was a good egg for sure. Next, we have our heir to the throne and firstborn, Peter. Peter is one that, in my classroom, we might call him a flat character or underdeveloped, but because we're really channeling that bedtime story motif, it works. It actually really works with Peter's character being one who is born good. Peter is exactly that, folks. He is born good. He does the right thing every time. He gravitates to anything that's morally just. He's kind, compassionate, patient, just a good guy all around. He is a mensch. He's just a sweetheart all the time. This is incredibly unrealistic, of course. It's not really real, but in this fantasy world, it does work, especially when the chips are down for Peter. He really has to dig deep inside and figure out who he is in that struggle. And so the being born good thing actually is of great advantage to him. But that's Peter. We're going to discuss Peter in greater detail in our next section because there's a lot of good stuff there. But he is our royal prince who is born good. He's going to be a wonderful king. Everybody loves him. 
And I think the reader does too. I think we really like Peter because we don't really have a reason not to, unless you just hate <laughs> slightly underdeveloped characters, but he's just a good young man. And he is someone who we cheer for, especially when the tables turn in the form of injustice on Peter. More on that later. But next we have little Thomas. Little Thomas is born five years later. And what I love about Thomas is King also takes him in a unique direction. Usually we get a really sinister, jealous younger brother who becomes a little sadist. And we do get a little bit of that with Thomas, but King does a wonderful job of putting the spotlight on Thomas's pain. Thomas is a sad, sad, sad little boy. He grows up into a very sad young adult, young man, and it reminds me a great deal of all the Britlet I've read about children in boarding schools. Oh my goodness. The English and their affluent boarding schools. It's heartbreaking. These young children are ripped away from their parents when they're absolutely not ready to be on their own and sent to these other countries, other cities, and they're just so lonely and they're so sad and they want to go home. And that is the mood and the overall character connection I sense in Thomas. He is a sad, lonely young man who feels unloved and rejected and despised by his father, even though it's really not that bad. It's just his father, King Roland, is aloof and spacey and disconnected and disassociated from his role as father. He doesn't really know how to love Thomas, and unfortunately, Thomas does not have a maternal figure in his life. We don't have eyes on whether or not Thomas had a kind of surrogate mother in his world. So this is a lonely, sad young man who maintains that throughout the story. So it's really, really interesting. He's also incredibly envious of his older brother, Peter. Peter also seems to be too busy doing his own thing. So this is a kind of lonely world for everybody. And you either got to plug in and stay busy and tunnel vision yourself, or you're going to be incredibly sad and lonely. And that's what Thomas is. He's an emotional young man very unfulfilled, and unfortunately, that is a prime spot for manipulation. Ooh, more on that in a second. These next two characters I absolutely love. We don't have a lot of details on these individuals, but this great duo is Brandon and Dennis. I don't believe we have a last name. I don't have one written down here in my notes, so forgive the lapse in details. But Brandon is the king's butler, and his family has been butler to the royal family, to the king, princes, etc., for generations. So this is a huge badge of pride and honor. Young Dennis, of course, is observing his father, Brandon, and he is Peter's butler. So he has learned everything he needs to know from his father, and his father is just full of honor and dedication, consistently telling Dennis, always do your best, always be the best. You have no idea how lucky our family has been. You have no idea how special this job is, this position we have, this influence we have. Make sure you always do whatever you can to serve your master. So Brandon's just the best. He's just full of pride and honor and does an amazing job as the king's butler. And of course, Dennis is doing an equally wonderful job as Peter's butler. These two definitely get into a sticky situation where they get some evidence presented to them and they have to speak out and it ends up being a really, really bad situation. But these two just fill me with such admiration. They kind of make my heart swell with people who are kind of unadulterated and pure. These are pure, good people who have so much pride and honor. They want to do the right thing always. They want to do well at their job always. I just have so much interest in both of them. So I just, oh, I love Brandon and Dennis. Even though they don't get a lot of screen time, they shine very, very bright. They're incredibly memorable. I really, really love them both. 
Dennis, we get a lot more screen time with. He is tremendous. He's someone who just moves me. Brandon and Dennis. Our final character in Spotlight needs no introduction for all constant readers out there. If you have spent a good amount of time with King, there's a high probability that you've read the heavy hitter novels that we haven't covered a lot of on this podcast. However, I do try to do my best with the film adaptations. What I'm talking about, folks, is 1978's The Stand. This is considered one of King's masterworks. It's incredible, of course. I need to finish it. I've read about halfway, and I don't know what happened. I just stopped reading. But you guys know that. In the novel The Stand, we have the great enemy and adversary of everybody in that book, and he goes by the name of Randall Flagg. Flagg is the magician to the king. And for my Lord of the Rings fans out there, what I thought of Flagg in this role as a magician is one that reminded me of Grima Wormtongue, who was poisoning the king of Rohan, if you guys pick up what I'm putting down, fantasy nerds out there. But Flagg is a hooded figure lurking in the shadows, and he is someone who we are going to spend a lot more time discussing in the next section, but he really wants the destruction of Delane. Flagg is powerful, old, old as hell, guys. And in the novel, it is said that he has existed in Delane for almost 400 years, I believe. 400 years ago, he had a different face because Flag is able to do that. He was known as Browson, and he was a singer, an entertainer of some kind, ended up causing a war, which is his chief goal, is destruction, chaos, anarchy, etc., And then 250 years after that, he was the kingdom's executioner, known as Bill Hinch, carrying around an axe. More on that later. But now, he is very close to the king, one would almost say the right hand of the king, reading all kinds of sacred texts, a man of few words, many eyes, many secrets, a lot of power. And he is just so cool. I... (laughs) I talk to constant readers quite a bit on this show, and we always talk about our favorite villains, and I really do believe Randall Flagg is my favorite Stephen King villain, and it is because of the numerous iterations he takes. Friends, it's just so cool. Personally, I'm a huge fan of immortal stuff. Ugh, I love it. It really blows my dress up. I absolutely adore vampire stuff, gothic stuff, anything to do with someone who has the power of immortality. It really, really intrigues me because somebody who cannot die, all that they see, all that their soul comes to know, or if they even have a soul, I don't know. They could just be an ageless husk in there. And regarding Flag, that very well may be the case based on his true nature. As you can see, I'm super jonesing for our next section. But Flag is so cool in this story, guys. I really enjoy when he's on the page, when he is subtle and silent and a man of few words, and then towards the end, whoa! We get Flag in a way I've never seen him before. Very dramatic, very frightening, very intense. It was a joy to observe Flag slash Randall Flag slash the walking dude slash someone from the Dark Tower I don't want to mention because I don't want to spoil anything. But yes, he is the one to watch. He is so cool in this, friends. Oh man, if you are remotely a Flag fan, even just a little bit, I know he's pretty despicable in the stand and we really shouldn't be a fan of his, but if you have a tiny itch that's into Flag as a villain, this is a wonderful novel to kind of sit in the back and get your binoculars and really take a look at how this guy is operating. We're going to unpack more about Flag in the next section. We're going to unpack more of everything in the next section. As you can hear, I'm excited, folks. But to recap my favorite seven characters from within 
Eyes of the Dragon, we have the following. King Roland the Good, Queen Sasha, Peter, Thomas, Brandon and Dennis, and Flag. (laughs) Such a great list. And as we spoke earlier in the introduction about this whole thing being a sweet story for his beloved daughter Naomi, we even have a character named Naomi in the latter half of this novel. She gets an honorable mention. I think she must. She's totally cute. She has a very sweet husky dog named Frisky. She is strong and wise and effervescent. I really, really liked Naomi. And to know that this whole thing is for her is so, so sweet. Major dad-daughter love felt from that. All right, folks, that's all I have for characters found within the eyes of the dragon. Next up is our section on the strengths and what's working well within this novel. Grab your torches as we head into the secret passageway. We can't keep flag waiting. I'll see you there. All right, my brave souls, the moon is full and the stone steps are before us. Let us discuss the strengths and what's working really well inside Eyes of the Dragon. Of course, I have a million notes. I was scribbling like a madwoman because I enjoyed this story so much, but I think I've narrowed it down to about four solid categories. Yep, I think we got a good solid four. So we are going to kick it off with the first category, which is our mysterious narrator. Okay, guys, so what I really love about our narrator is that this is a person. They are genderless. They are ageless. We have no idea who they are. One could assume it's king, but we can't. We really can't do that. We just don't have any textual evidence to support that. But this is a completely omniscient narrator who is connected to modern day. That's what's so interesting. At first, as I was making my way through the novel, this narrator makes it seem like he has lived in Delane for a very long time, as if this could be a very old citizen of the kingdom retelling this story because he or she lived through it. We don't know. But then there are these subtle little lines about much different from the world we know today. Lines like that where you're like, what? Things that definitely indicate that he is from a future, which blows my mind even more. Because how is that possible? How did this narrator get the story from Delane if they are, in fact, a person of our world? Ah, there's some Dark Tower craziness cooking up in here. I feel it! But this mysterious narrator is so intriguing. He, she, or they softly take you by the hand as the reader. The narration, it is subtle, it is elegant, really, really lovely to read. And I cannot emphasize that enough. There's such a delicate beauty here. It doesn't seem like King is trying all that hard. It doesn't seem contrived. It's delicate. It's delicate, effortless, smooth. And there's this mysterious, omniscient narrator taking us through this third person account. I'm so curious. I'm so curious what they are all about. It's really, really enjoyable. And it's like the cherry on the sundae. This narrator, had it been told any other way without this narrator kind of anthropomorphizing his or herself, I don't know if it would be as magical. There's definitely more whimsy because there is a character, a mysterious one, telling the story. So I really, really like that. It's such an enjoyable part. Next, and this is a big one, a big category, 
I do have to take us to Sunday school for just a tiny second, but it'll be the scholarly kind. This is the academic kind. The next category we're going to explore is biblical illusion slash strong symbolism within Eyes of the Dragon. For those of you who've been listening to the podcast for a hot minute, you know not only do I have my MFA in creative writing with a fiction emphasis, but I also have a minor in religious studies, specifically the Western religions, the top three, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. I really enjoy looking at it from an academic lens, and so anytime we get some biblical illusion within King's work, I nerd out hardcore because we can draw some pretty spectacular parallels, and boy, does this story have them. Whoa, guys. Get ready. Get ready for what I am going to unpack. Okay. For those of you who attend a faith-based institution, or if you have studied these scholastically at any time in your personal life, it might ring a bell. For those of you who have no idea, that's okay too. So the first area of biblical illusion I want to explore with all of you guys today is, of course, Cain and Abel. Hopefully all of us know about Cain and Abel. If you don't, no worries. You could pick up whatever sacred text you want associated with Judaism and Christianity, the Tanakh, Bible. You can head over to whatever internet source you like. But Cain and Abel is a sacred story from the book of Genesis about two brothers and how one brother killed the other. So spoiler alert, I'm going to reveal some stuff. But Cain and Abel is a biblical tale that is used throughout literature all the time, friends. Wow, it is used a lot. If you're someone who is into Cain and Abel stuff, I highly recommend John Steinbeck's East of Eden. That is a novel that keeps on giving, let me tell you. So if you are forced to do a book report, choose that one. You're going to really, really enjoy it. Getting off track here, Cain and Abel. Abel is the second son from Adam and Eve. You guys know them. Their first son is Cain. Pretty sure. Could be getting that wrong. They actually might be twins. (laughs) It's been a minute since I've plugged in. They're either twins or Cain is the oldest and Abel is the youngest. Back in the day, long, long, long time ago, anytime one would want to commune with the divine, it was required that you sacrifice a lamb. You had to burn this sacrifice on a little pyre there, and then it would be accepted by God. So Abel did this. He got his little lamb, he was a shepherd, and sacrificed it, and God was pleased as the story goes. Cain was a farmer, and he grew beautiful, gorgeous, stunning fruits and vegetables, and so he decided, I don't really want to kill a lamb, we don't necessarily know why, but he just wanted to do something different, potentially because he was envious of Abel, because Abel was very beloved, we are told. We are told that Abel was the favorite son. We don't really know how or why, but it could be potentially a Peter thing, right? Peter in the story, I should say. Cain brings a beautiful cornucopia of fruits and vegetables as his sacrifice, and God rejects it. Cain is pissed. Pissed! All caps, everybody. Like, the most pissed you've ever been. And he snaps and murders his brother Abel. He kills his brother, and in some very dramatic Old Testament fashion, I believe the exact verse is, Abel's blood cried out from the ground. Really great stuff. Technically speaking, according to the sacred text, this would be the world's first murder, and God asks Cain, where's your brother? He, of course, already knows. And then it's just this whole thing, and then the mark of Cain is this agelessly debated thing, and basically Cain is cursed for what he does to his brother. And scholars say that really all Cain had to do was just do the sacrifice the way God asked, according to the story. Cain felt unloved and rejected because God didn't like his fruits and vegetables, but in reality, God said, you just disobeyed me. I asked for a certain way. You deviated from what I asked for. That's why I didn't accept it, because you weren't listening to me. You disobeyed. Ergo, this was supposed to help you. But you freaked out and murdered your brother, and now you're really in a pickle. So, (laughs) this is, of course, extremely irreverent and sacrilegious. Please forgive me, anybody out there who is taking this to heart. I promise, (laughs) if we were in an academic setting, I would be much more reverent. Please forgive me. But... 
in a nutshell, one cannot argue that's kind of how the story goes down. Cain envied his brother. Abel envied the love he received, the favor he received. But if he would have only shifted his perspective and done the sacrifice correctly, the way it was asked, things might have been different. That's a whole story for another day, but I bring it up because we do have two brothers in this story. Peter and Thomas, one older and one younger. Peter, of course, is born good, seemingly like Abel. Cain is our Thomas. Thankfully, Thomas didn't really have such a vindictive spirit to harm his brother. He couldn't have. He's the younger brother. He does harm a defenseless dog in the novel. It's awful. Watch out, animal lovers. But of course, we're all used to it in King's works. If you're not used to it, buckle up. It sucks. I digress. So Cain and Abel is definitely something I observed right away regarding Peter and Thomas. Thomas is seething with envy toward his brother. His brother Peter is kind of aloof to that. I don't think we get a lot of connection between the two of them. I don't think they got to spend a lot of time together because of their age difference. So interesting stuff going on there. But the first biblical allusion is, of course, Cain and Abel between Peter and Thomas. Next, I want to explore the name of Peter. We're going to flip to the New Testament in our Bibles. Peter is, of course, the apostle who was firstly known as Simon. He was a fisherman. Jesus appears to him one day and says, come with me, I'll make you fishers of men. Simon's the guy who denies Jesus three times, makes a lot of mistakes on his walk. But ultimately, the reason why Peter is so revered is there's this very pivotal verse in the New Testament. I believe it's in the book of Matthew chapter 15. Oh, I'm a little squidgy there where Jesus says to Peter, upon this rock, I shall build my church. What they are talking about is Jesus is asking the apostles, what's everybody saying about me? Because without going too much into it, the Jews believed in a warrior messiah who was going to come and kill all their enemies and unite the kingdom and all that good stuff. So Jesus was asking, do they think I'm that guy? And that's how the conversation got started. Jesus says to Peter, upon this rock, I shall build my church. Now, here's where it's fascinating because many Catholics believe literally, <laughs> that the verse meant upon Peter, Peter the person that I would build the church. That is why Peter was crucified upside down in Rome and thereafter became the vicar of Christ, which is where we get the Pope and the papacy. <laughs> Many other scholars disagree and say that's not what was intended with that verse, but I digress, the Apostle Peter. If you really want to read into it, I think there are some Apostle Peter character traits that we can plug into our Peter in Eyes of the Dragon. I know that's a stretch, but if you did spend a little bit of time in Sunday School, you could see, okay, this is a loyal person, of which Peter was. This is someone moral and just, and in the end, Peter was like that. So some interesting parallels, just saying, take it with a grain of salt. Our next person is, of course, Thomas. Thomas was another apostle. The apostle Thomas is most known for being Doubting Thomas. That is the moniker he was given which I think it's a little harsh because after the crucifixion and resurrection, when Jesus is most definitely alive and walking around, he comes over to the apostles. And Thomas is like, no way, I don't believe this at all. No way, you're not real. I'm crazy. I've lost the plot. And so that is when Jesus actually shows him the wounds from the crucifixion, the holes in his hands from the nails and in his feet. So if you want to spend some time in the Gospels, you will learn about Thomas. But he's always called Doubting Thomas. I think that's kind of unfair because I think based on what he had to deal with in that moment, it's okay that he questioned his sanity, he questioned what was happening, and uh, Jesus seemed okay with it. He seemed totally fine, sort of verifying that, yep, it's me. So that is Thomas, doubting Thomas, which that doubt always gives the apostle Thomas, it makes him associated with weakness, which 
Thomas is a weak individual. It's not his fault. He really didn't get a good start in life. He can't connect with his brother. He can't connect with his father. He is sad and lonely. And I think an emotional outburst like we have in the Gospels and the fact that Thomas is associated with weakness in the Gospels, it kind of makes a little bit of sense, just a tiny bit, that the name Thomas would kind of echo loudly for this character. All right. Our last zone of biblical illusion is the biggest one of all. Hopefully you guys have an idea of what I'm going to talk about, but if not, let's flip over to the book of Luke. There is a scene where Jesus is heading into town, I don't remember what town unfortunately, and he meets a man on the road who is demon-possessed. And what's interesting, I am not a demonologist, I don't know a lot about that stuff. I know the Catholic Church has a lot of good stuff on that, but I've never really studied it in depth. But I do know from my own readings that if you approach a demon, granted really not wise, (laughs) if uh, you don't have the spiritual strength behind that, just saying, but if you ask a demon their name, they're going to tell you, and they all have individual names. So Jesus asks this man who's thrashing and really carrying on and really, really very exorcist about the whole thing. He asks this demon his name, and this demon tells him, Our name is Legion, for we are many. Mic drop, everybody. So then Jesus casts the demons into a herd of pigs, which pigs are a filthy animal in Jewish culture, so they would not have been ingested anyway and the pigs run over a cliff. It's really dramatic, it's really memorable. I mention Legion because if you guys watched the 2022, yeah, 2021 miniseries of The Stand that premiered on Paramount Plus, basically Randall Flagg announces to Mother Abigail in that adaptation, I am Legion. And it makes so much sense that King would use a New Testament demon to change his face because we are many. Legion is many demonic entities. He's not the devil, he is a devil with many faces. And this allows Flag to morph throughout time. He is ageless, undead, and as a demon, they really want the simplest things, friends. All demons slash devils slash evil entities that you are associating with the big Satan, they just want destruction. Another Bible verse that blew my mind is in the book of 1 Peter. Coinkering? I think not. I think it's 1 Peter chapter 5? Yeah, I think I have that written down here. And of course, I didn't memorize the verse word for word like I should have. But the verse goes something along the lines of, beware, your enemy is everywhere, walking around seeking that which to devour. Given the fact that Randall Flagg was the walking dude, walking up and down the world after Captain Trips had depleted everybody of life, walking and walking and walking, seeking whom he could devour. That is the essence of evil. And this devil, this legion, they all want the same things, folks. They all want a very simple thing, and that is destruction. They want to destroy humanity, harm humanity, because it wounds the divine. The divine, if observed in the sacred texts, loves mankind, created mankind, is invested in mankind. So if you hate the divine, you're going to really make it hard for his creation. That's what devils do. That's what Legion does. Flag in Eyes of the Dragon wants to destroy Delane brick by brick. He wants war. He wants famine. He wants disease. The four horsemen of the apocalypse. He would like to beckon them to Delane's doorstep today. And he fears Peter, because Peter is good. Peter is prophesied as the coming of the white. And what's cool inside the lore of Delane, of which we don't have a lot of lore, but what we have is magical, 
It seems as though Flag has been working to destroy Delane for several hundred years, but something happens within the bloodline where every couple years, someone is born and they're just wonderful. They are sweet and good and powerful and mighty. They unite the kingdom and they destroy the evil growing against them. They destroy that growing shadow of defeat. They destroy it. Peter being born good makes a lot of sense because I do believe there's something very, very key in the bloodline found within Delane. But Flag fears slash dislikes Peter because he is good and devils, devils like Legion, they just want to bring about destruction. Harm humanity, wound the divine, that's all they want. Simple, simple, simple. Oh, and they never tell the truth. Remember, everything out of their mouth is a lie. A lie. A lie. It might sound like the truth, but it's a lie. (laughs) That's all you gotta know. So if you want to know anything about devils, everything is a lie, and they're trying to destroy you. Period. Pure and simple. Don't take the deal. (laughs) So Flag is absolutely huge, guys. He's a juggernaut of New Testament illusion alluding to Legion, this demon that Jesus went face to face with. And he said, we got a lot of people in here. That's why our name is Legion. That's Flag changing his face every couple hundred years. I love it. I love it. I love it. Do a little bit of New Testament research if you would like to learn more. But that's all I have for biblical illusion. I know that was a big chunk. I like to nerd out. We just have a few more, just a few more, and this next one's going to be totally fun. Okay, the other category I super duper love about Eyes of the Dragon, many story winks within. One of them, of course, Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption. That story was written in 1982, approximately, give or take a year composed for the novella collection Different Seasons, but as we all know from either the short story or the film, we have young Andy Dufresne falsely imprisoned for murder, and he does everything he can over the span of 20 years in the film and 27 years in the novella to chisel his way out. It's amazing, it's breathtaking. We have a little bit of that in this story because our beloved Peter is imprisoned for a while, and he really has to dig down and find some hope and find some ingenuity and pursue escape. It's amazing. So we've got some beautiful story winks headed toward Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption. We also have a big one, big, big, big wink for The Shining. Oh, for all of my Shining fans out there, the last couple scenes with Flag are spectacularly creepy and you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about when you get there. So if you are a fan of The Shining, there is a huge story link toward the end of Eyes of the Dragon. And then lastly, this might be a stretch because it technically wasn't composed yet, The Green Mile. The Green Mile is one of my top five kings. I'm obsessed. I'm in love. I weep. I swoon. It's just the most beautiful novel. And inside that novel is a little mouse named Mr. Jingles. And we got some mice in this story. Not a lot of good things happen to them, but we do have some mice that play pivotal roles in the narrative. And I couldn't help but connect the two. I couldn't help it, folks. So we do have a wink towards the Green Mile, which is still in the ether. It's still a decade away, but it made me think about it. And anytime I get to think about the Green Mile, I am content. I am happy. I am at peace. (laughs) So I counted three big story winks within the King universe. There may be more. I think there are, especially Dark Tower related, but I am only four books into my Dark Tower journey, so unknown if I've missed any Dark Tower connections. I most likely have. I promise to do further research on that. Our last category before we head out of here is, of course, the elegant narration. Oh, friends, it's just so beautiful. It's just so beautiful. And what better way to bring that out than to read a slice of the novel. I gotta do it, I gotta do it. Just listen to the language, listen to the subtlety, listen to the beautiful way he decides to go about this. I am reading from the American hardcover. This is on page 95 in the micro chapter of 33. 
The court physician amplified one word to three, murder by poison. He did not say murder by dragon sand, for the poison was unknown in Delane except a flag. The king died shortly before midnight, but by dawn the charge was rife in the city and spreading outward toward the far reaches of the eastern, western, southern, and northern baronies. Murder, regicide, rolling the good, dead by poison. Even before then, Flagg had organized a search of the castle, from the highest point, the eastern tower, to the lowest, the dungeon of Inquisition, with its racks and manacles and squeezing boots. Any evidence bearing on this terrible crime, he said, must be searched out and reported at once. The castle rang with the search. Six hundred grimly eager men combed through it. Only two small areas of the castle were exempt. These were the apartments of the two princes, Peter and Thomas. Thomas was barely aware of this. His fever had worsened to the point where the court physician had become deeply alarmed. He lay in a delirium as dawn's first light fingered its way into his windows. In his dreams, he saw two glasses of wine raised high, heard his father say again and again, Did you spice it? It tasted mulled. Flag had ordered the search, but by two in the morning, Peter had recovered enough of his wits to take charge of it. Flag led him. These next few hours would be terribly important, a time when all could be won or lost, and Flag knew it. The king was dead. The kingdom was momentarily headless, but not for long. This very day, Peter would be crowned king, but not for long. This very day, Peter would be crowned king at the foot of the needle unless the crime was brought home to the boy quickly and conclusively. Under other circumstances, Flag knew Peter would have been under suspicion at once. People always suspect those who have the most to gain, and Peter had gained a great deal by his father's death. Poison was horrible, but poison might have won him a kingdom. In this case, the people of the kingdom spoke of the boy's loss rather than the boy's gain. Of course, Thomas had lost his father too, they might add after a pause, almost as if they were ashamed of the momentary lapse. But Thomas was a sullen, sulky, awkward boy who had often argued with his father. Peter's affection and respect for Roland, on the other hand, were known far and wide. And why, people would ask. If the monstrous idea was even raised, and so far it had not been, why would Peter kill his father for the crown when he would surely inherit it in a year, or three, or five? If evidence of the crime were to be found in a secret place that only Peter knew, however, a place in the prince's own rooms, the tide would turn quickly. People would begin to see a murderer's face beneath a mask of affection and respect. They would point out that to the young, a year may seem like three, three like nine, five like twenty-five. Then they would point out that the king had seemed, in the last few days of his life, to be coming out of a long, dark time, had seemed to be growing hale and vigorous again. Perhaps, they would say, Peter had believed his father was entering a long, healthy Indian summer, had panicked and done something as foolish as it was monstrous. Flag knew something else. He knew that people have a deep and instinctive distrust of all kings and princes, for these are people who may order their deaths with a single nod, and for crimes as petty as dropping a handkerchief in their presence. Great kings are loved, lesser kings are tolerated, kings to be represent a scary, unknown quantity. They might come to love Peter if given a chance, but Flag knew they would also condemn him quickly if shown enough evidence. Flag thought such evidence would be forthcoming soon. Nothing more than a mouse, small, but big enough in its way to shake a kingdom to its foundations. Oh, my dears, wasn't that lovely? Oh, I can't explain it. It's just, it's so pretty. It's so pretty and delicate and light and layered. It really reminds me of creme brulee. <laughs> Clearly, I'm hungry and maybe need some dessert, but I mention creme brulee because for the most part, it's kind of a plain dessert. This is a vanilla custard with a little bit of sugar on top. They caramelize it. You maybe get some berries next to it, but it is perfect, you guys. It's one of my favorite desserts, that and tiramisu. Creme brulee, it's simple, and yet after dinner, it could be the most magical thing. 
I think this novel's creme brulee, folks. It is just the vanilla is perfect. The sugar is perfect. The custard's perfect. The berry is perfect. Everything is working together so well. Simple, but stunningly beautiful in its simplicity. I'm such a fan. This little bedtime story has just given me wings, everyone. Oh, wow. This was such a huge chunk of our investigation, my loves. Let's head on out of here and talk about some criticism and my final thoughts on Eyes of the Dragon. You guys have been troopers. Up, 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 up the stairs we go into the final room at the top of the needle where the prince awaits. Let's head that way and I'll see you in the next section. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the top of the needle where our homeboy Peter needs our help. We are going to assist him before Flag gets here. But before we get into the criticism found within Eyes of the Dragon, I forgot to recap our previous section, so let's go back and do that. I got way too excited and completely forgot. Looking back at what we covered in the strengths within Eyes of the Dragon, we took a look at our very mysterious narrator. Don't know when or where he or she or they are from, but it's peculiar and working very, very well. Next, we segued into the strong symbolism and biblical illusion within these characters. Peter definitely has some Apostle Simon Peter energy going on with his journey of impulsive faithfulness, wishy-washy devotion at times, but ultimately a highly favored individual with a moral path that's stronger than the rest of ours, I think. We also have Thomas in close connection with the Apostle of Doubting Thomas. He was given the moniker Doubting Thomas because his lack of faith which can be associated with a weaker spirit, and our character of Thomas definitely demonstrates that a little bit. Poor sweet baby. I don't blame him. He didn't really have a good setup in life, but toward the end of the novel, I really feel Thomas gets an awesome character arc. Between both brothers exhibited a bit of Cain and Abel, not as aggressively violent as the Cain and Abel story, but it is there. It is very present. And lastly, we took a look at Flag, the magician. Just Flag this time. Not Randall Flag, not Richard Faraday. <laughs> Another aliases that have popped up throughout the King universe. This is the dark man that keeps populating throughout time and space within the king world, and we can directly connect him to the New Testament as the demon Legion, whom Jesus confronts and casts into a herd of pigs, according to the book of Luke. It's working, it's there, flag as Legion. One area I didn't really get a lot of time to talk about was, of course, our Queen Sasha, the napkins. I'm not going to divulge too much about the napkins. They play a huge, 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 beyond huge role in this story. Some constant readers believe it highly implausible. Yes, but this is a fantasy story and we need to have radical acceptance with that, of which I did. But there is a beautiful scene with Queen Sasha and young Peter at the beginning of the novel in which a napkin is present and there's a really poignant moment there. So I feel Queen Sasha is associated with the napkins and what they eventually provide to our hero Peter. Next we took a look at story winks of which there were several. Reading Eyes of the Dragon made me think of The Shining, Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption, as well as The Green Mile. I know that last one is a stretch, but I love it. We're going to go with it. And lastly, we took a look at the really elegant prose. Delicate, lovely, really well done. I am a fan. All right, my dears, now that that is out of the way, I can focus on the criticism found within Eyes of the Dragon. I think the biggest one, which has strong roots in many branches, has to do with the 
lack of lore that definitely left me wanting much, much more. But I will say I'm content with what King has provided. We don't have a lot to describe this world, this time, this kingdom. He leaves a lot to the imagination, but every now and again we get a couple cute little things. For example, the cocktail of the day is called Bundle Gin, and everybody drinks it. I don't know what it is. Gin is in the title, so we can maybe head that direction. But stuff like that, I just wanted much more of. There are two particular categories in regards to the lore that I feel would have really enhanced the story quite a bit. Firstly, dragons. So dragons are absolutely quintessential to the fantasy genre. Not always, of course, but mythical, magical creatures abound and dragons are definitely one of those. So what I really wish King would have done in regards to the dragon is just give us a little bit more. For example, the dragon that we have within this story is a taxidermied dragon that King Roland killed many years ago. Which leads me to believe that dragons are really kind of seen as just open game, like any other animal. Given their size, I'm sure it was a really good day if you kill a dragon, but there's no details of any sort of special connection to them. And I think a lot of fantasy writers really take their time to give the dragon the spotlight and make it completely unique to their world. For example, George R. R. Martin does some amazing things with dragons. House Targaryen never really should have domesticated them, but then there's this genealogical connection to controlling them, and other authors have psychic connections to the dragons, where the dragons sync life cycles with their humans. So when they eat, the human eats. When they rest, the human rests. Really cool, cool stuff. King does not go as in-depth with that. We have a taxidermied dragon named Niner, and it's mostly significant for how it is used by Flag. But other than the fact that King Roland killed this dragon sometime in his youth, we don't get much more details on dragons in this world. Are they completely extinct? Are they still alive and roaming the skies? Do they breathe fire? How big are they? Given the fact that this taxidermy dragon named Niner is within the king's chamber, I would assume it's on the larger side, but like how large? <laughs> so I was so hungry for more details there, folks, but King does not provide that. It's okay, but I was a little bit eager to learn more about how dragons are incorporated in the Kingdom of Delane and this particular world. The next area that was a definite, not red flag, but it definitely stuck in my mind a little bit, and that is the nature of deities in the Kingdom of Delane. For example, there are multiple sentences throughout in which a character is referred to he or she prayed to their gods, prayed to his god, prayed to her god, and sometimes it's plural, sometimes it's singular. This is huge! This is so huge and King doesn't even touch it because he just doesn't and it's so frustrating. Who are these gods? Are we talking about traditional monotheistic society? What god are they praying to? Which gods? What do they look like? What do they do? What do they provide? What's their stories? That is everywhere in this story and I was, oh, I was getting so irritated because I wanted to know more. I was so hungry for more especially concerning the character of Peter. Peter has a lot of solitude for a good chunk of this story, and there's a lot of introspection and seemingly spiritual development. He's definitely going inward to find hope and to find perseverance. It would have been great to learn more about which god he's talking about, which god Peter obeys, but some people have plural gods. I, oh man. I was hungry for more. Really, really wishing we could have had more of that. More dragons, more gods, more about the source of bundle gin. <laughs> Is it an effervescent spirit? Is it a moonshine type brew? I, I want to know. I want to know all these things. That makes the kingdom of Delane real and we just, ugh, we don't have it. So that wasn't my favorite in regards to this story. The second area of criticism I have is in regards to the character of Ben Stodd. 
Ben Ben Benny. This is a lovely character who we meet in the latter half of the novel. He just appears out of nowhere after Peter has been convicted of the king's murder. This guy is just an average Joe in the castle, hard worker. He's got his parents who are a little bit worry warts as they should be because it's wild times in Delane. Now that Thomas is the king of Delane, things aren't going so hot. People are disappearing, violence not going well. Ben Stodd is Peter's friend, and in the latter half of the story, he's instrumental in the final outcomes of the story, specifically assisting Peter. But what was hard for me to digest is we don't have any information on how they became friends. Peter is a highborn. Ben is a lowborn or a commoner. How did they meet? I may have missed this. It could have been just something really quick. They must have been schoolmates or playmates of some kind, but I don't recall. I must have missed it, definitely, but because it wasn't strong enough to solidify details in my mind, I I think we need a little bit of attention there. I like the character of Ben, and there's actually some great scenes with he and Naomi. He's an enjoyable character, a sweet person, very, very helpful, a good friend. I don't know how he and Peter are friends. I really wish we would have had mention of Ben earlier in the story, so I could have made that connection. So when he pops up in the second half, I'm well aware I know all about Ben, or I have heard of him before. Granted, I definitely could have missed something. So if you constant readers are making your way through Eyes of the Dragon and there's just a glaring error that I stepped into, by all means, please email me at underratedsk at gmail or any of the socials and let me know. Girlfriend, open your eyeballs. (laughs) It was right here. Feel free to give me page numbers, quotes. That would be so, so helpful, but I can't find it, friends. I can't. I cannot find any connections with Ben and Peter in the first half of the story. Just not present at all. Kind of annoyed by that because I really want to love Ben for who he is in the second half of our story, but find I can't really connect to him because I'm confused and curious. Like, how do you know Peter? How long have you been friends? Why are you friends? Why, after all this time, are you still friends with Peter? What's been going on? It just seemed a little bit thrown together and definitely thrown in there last minute. Like, oh, Peter needs some people on the outside who can provide some assistance. (laughs) Let's write about this guy named Ben Stott. I'm okay with it. I radically accept what's going on in this story because this is my first time encountering Fantasy King and I really did overall enjoy this experience a great deal. Even though I was left hungry for more details, the beauty greatly outweighs any sort of peccadilloes I have. But regarding Ben, more details, Stevie. Come on, help me love these characters but I need greater connections established. (laughs) We need a little bit more that links them together in order to really make the final outcomes of this novel. We want the landing to stick, you know, and I think it's a little wobbly. Still good, just wobbly. My other notes kind of derive from the lack of lore in general, and of course all the questions I have are in regards to the lack of lore. So I won't go into too much depth on that front, but what I will say to conclude my thoughts on Eyes of the Dragon is how much I enjoyed Fantasy King. I enjoyed it way more than I do Sci-Fi King. Every sort of King sci-fi iteration thus far has provided more disappointment than enjoyment. For example, the Tommyknockers. Although the Tommyknockers is such an outlier, I don't know if it can be counted. The premise is amazing, the execution is yikes, (laughs) but that's kind of known. That's known throughout the Constant Reader community. It's a strange story because King was aboard the Hot Mess Express on that one. The Langoliers. I wanted to love that story with every cell in my body. Unfortunately, we just didn't have enough to make it work. The King sci-fi that does really work for me is, of course, From a Buick 8. I had a great time with that one. But I would say the sci-fi isn't as strong as the philosophy in From a Buick 8. A lot more philosophy that gave me a lot more joy than the 
actual science behind it. But still, lots of great stuff. I want King to write a great deal more fantasy, and it looks like I got my wish because Fairy Tale was released last year, and that is the next story that I will be diving into now that I have read Eyes of the Dragon. I also believe the Talisman is fantasy as well. I think I'm right on that. I think I'm correct. We might have to head that direction shortly after. Fairy Tale will be the next novel I'm going to explore. But, ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to report something kind of happened. I am leading a Stephen King book club in my local community right now, and there has been a request for a different novel, and I'm gonna go for it, and it's gonna be a huge surprise. I'm not gonna reveal any more, but I think that might slide into the spot where Fairy Tale was. I think it's happening. I have my copy of Fairy Tale open and ready to go started the first few chapters, and then this other King title grabbed my attention. I grabbed that, started the first few chapters, and I am falling in love all over again. This is one they have read before, but I have not done a podcast episode on it. I think it's gonna have to happen, and I believe it'll be the summer surprise nobody was expecting. It might happen, it might not, so it'll either be fairy tale next or a crazy huge wild surprise. <laughs> we shall see. But that's about all I have for Eyes of the Dragon. If there is anything I super duper missed, please reach out. I would love to hear from you guys on what you thought about this episode, as well as what you think about this Fantasy King story. I know for the most part this is one that doesn't get a lot of eyes on it, and if people do read it, I don't know if they like it a lot, but I could be wrong on that. Hopefully there are a lot of people who like it. Last I checked, this has middle of the road reviews, so I definitely want more people to read it. And if you plug into the audiobook, Bronze and Pinchot does a spectacular job, and you will be entertained. I would love to chat more about this with all of you, especially that last scene with Flag as executioner Bill Hinch with the axe. Crazy, crazy stuff. I really enjoyed it. Lots to love in this little story, and I'm a happy camper. Thank you all so very much for listening. If you haven't yet said hi, feel free to do so at our Gmail address or any of the socials. Share this show with a friend if you haven't already, and it would be wonderful if you would rate and review us, subscribe, as it will greatly help us reach more fans of King, more curious, not yet on the King train. We'd like to reach those as well, but I gotta get to reading. Take care. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.